okay, I've got about two hours of shop time into this project so far. And if you remember from the first part of this build, I've allotted five hours total before I start to cut into the profit margin. Well, today I'm gonna finish up the build and I'm feeling pretty good about the three hours left to get all the work done. So I'm gonna start by gluing up some panels for the shelves. The shelves will be 10 inches wide and 16 and three quarter inches long, but they're only five eighths of an inch thick. So I do have a lot of room to play with in the thickness area. With this six inch stock, I'll need a total of eight pieces to glue into four panels. So I'll cross cut them to 18 inches long for a little extra room to play with later. No need to be hyper accurate here. At 18 inches, I'm leaving more than an inch extra. Now is when you practice your sawing technique with little fear of making an irreparable mistake. So take your time, assess how each cut goes, then adjust your stance and try again. It's pressure free sawing practice, so take advantage of it. I'm back to my hybrid milling technique here, and you'll find that with these pieces cut down to only 18 inches, they register pretty firmly on a flat surface like my bench top. So I'll mark the high corners here, producing the slight rocking motion, and then I'll plane them away. Now, if you look at the second piece, you can see I'm already registering flat on the bench. So I'll just skip planing completely and mark the grain direction. Just remember when running through a thickness planer, you need to feed the board the opposite direction you would run hand plane because now the board is moving and the cutting stays still. On this other board, the four plane's set to take a medium shaving. Too heavy a cut here and you could end up making the twist worse. As you can see, it doesn't take more than a few strategic passes to kill the twist. Move the shavings out of the way and this board registers flat and is ready for the planer. Now back at the planer with one face registered firmly against the bed, I can quickly plane the opposite face. I'll flip all of these and plane the first face, leaving a board that is over final thickness by about an eighth of an inch. Now I just want to match up my panels according to grain and color match. Fortunately, that's pretty easy with maple, and I'll mark everything with cabinet makers triangles. Whenever I make panels, I use the match planing technique. With the adjacent boards folded up like a book, I'll clamp them in my leg vise. Now don't worry too much about getting the boards perfectly aligned, just get them close-ish as I specifically have left these boards wide to give me plenty of room to size them later. As a best practice, I actually aim to have one board a bit higher than the other. More on that in a second. Now with them clamped together, I can plane both edges at once, which will create a complementary angled face that will join together in a flat panel, regardless of what angle your plane runs across the edge. I wanna pay close attention to the shavings being injected here. I want twin shavings coming out and I wanna keep working until I get full width and full length twin shavings. Just like that. Now, if you look at the edge of the board, you can see I am planing off square. Remember when I said I clamped these so that one board was higher than the other? This intentionally slants the plane and you create a strongly beveled edge. This results in a glue line that is easier to get tight and seamless, just like double bevel marquetry technique. And here you can see the off 90 degree angle and how it comes together for a flat panel. Now a little glue on both edges and into the clamps it goes. See how that beveled edge tucks up under the other one? It's not quite the same as double bevel marquetry, but pretty close and I find it makes my panels respond predictably in the clamps. I know with enough pressure, one board will ride up over the other, so I drop a clamp on top to hold it in place. Now basically rinse and repeat till you have four shelf panels. While the panels are cooking in the clamps, I want to move over to the two back slots. These dados are a half inch deep, so when the whole thing comes together, it's going to be pretty rigid but those back slats will add just a touch of strength to prevent racking on the entire case, just like you would by adding a full back to a case. But on a display shelf like this, I don't want to block off the back. It's going to block light that could shine on the objects on the case. It's also going to make the whole thing look a lot beefier and chunkier, and I really don't want that look. 
but the two back slats add that rigidity and they also add this cool negative space look on the back of it. Those two slats are 3 eighths of an inch thick, they're one and a half inches wide, and they run from the top of the post to half an inch below the bottom shelf. So I need them to be 33 and a half inches long. Now I have this piece of eight quarter maple. This is left over from the board that I originally cut the legs out of. It was an eight foot board originally. I cut it in half and this is what was left over. I ran it through the planer and it's about one and three quarter inches thick right now. So what I can do is rip off some half inch wide strips rotate those 90 degrees, a little bit of planing, I'll have my 3 8 by one and a half inch strips without wasting a bunch of this leftover stock that could be used on another project. Again, I mark my line all the way around the board and flip it and saw from both faces just to check myself and my alignment. I do this about every 12 inches during the cut and I find it can correct any misalignment easily this way before it gets out of control. Finally, I tend to flip to the other end to finish my cut just so that I'm not working on a really skinny end on the saw bench. Now be honest here, I didn't even bother to check that these were flat before going through the planer. They'll be thin enough that bow is inevitable as the wood moves and narrow enough that cup is almost non-existent. At the same time, since they're thin and flexible, it's not worth the time to spot plane away any twist or cut. So I'll work until they're 3 eighths of an inch in thickness. Now since this board was previously planed on the faces, I already have a flat edge. So I'll mark that with a gauge to set its final width to the same as the legs, or one and a half inches. And now I just plane to the line. I'm going to remove the bulk of it with my four plane. Just recognize that with the heavily cambered edge, you got to make sure you don't introduce far too much bevel onto this edge. Now I'll come back with a block plane, smooth up any scallop marks, and take it right to the lines. Use your fingers trailing as a fence and your thumb down on top of that knob and you can really securely register and feel whether or not you're square to the edge. But basically just work to your knife lines. Then take it over to the shooting board and shoot one end of it to get it nice and square. Then I'll take that over and saw it to the final length of 33 and a half inches. A good saw here, nice and sharp, will leave a pretty clean cut, but I'm going to go ahead and shoot the opposite end to get it to final length. And just like that, I've got two slats ready to be installed. All right, I let these panels cook overnight. They're nice and dry, and I'm ready to continue flattening them and taking them to final thickness. Right now, they're just a bit over three quarters of an inch thick, and they need to be five eighths of an inch thick in order to fit the dados we've already cut in the posts. So I'm gonna tackle this just like I did with the rough panels. I'll set it down on my bench and see how firm is it. And inevitably, you're gonna get a little bit of rock because I've got this glue line that's putting that little hump in the middle and causing it to not ride securely. So, I could come in and clean this up with card scrapers or whatever just to get it to ride smoothly on the planer bed. But what I found works really well, and especially because I've got a little bit of thickness to play with here, I grab my four plane set to a pretty light cut, and I'll just make a pass right down the middle. And what that does is it creates the tiniest little bit of a hollow right here in the center of the panel. And when I bring it over to a flat reference surface, it registers perfectly flat, just like we were going for with the rough boards. The same technique will work great even if you didn't have the glue up go as planned. In this instance, the boards did slip a little bit and this board back here is high of the board in the front by about a 32nd of an inch. And I could come in and re-flatten the whole panel, but it's such a tiny little area that four plane pass right down the middle, creating that hollow will give me a nice stable surface to run it through the planer, this face up, make a couple passes, flip it over and clean up that hollow I created and this panel will be dead flat. My panels are still about 12 inches wide. So most benchtop planers can handle this. 
If your planer isn't wide enough, then the final width of these shelves only needs to be about 10 inches. So even the measliest of thickness planers can tackle these with ease if you trim a bit off first. Now don't just blindly plane away here. Remember, I have already cut the dados to receive these shelves, so when I flip them over to plane the second side, I'll keep a leg handy and sneak up on the fit. I want these tight, but not hammer tight. I shouldn't need more than about a sixteenth of an inch removed to hit that mark. And that's the fit I'm looking for, which is actually a little bit tighter than I want it. This is not the last step for this panel. I'm going to be smooth planing them and getting ready for finish, and that is going to reduce the thickness. So if you're worried about overshooting and getting a loose panel, purposely stay a little bit thick so you've got a really snug fit, and you can dial it in a thousandth of an inch at a time. It's real hard to go over when you're working in such small increments. So when you're happy with the fit, it's time to take these down to final size. First, I need to get some reference edges. So I'll joint one side. And then referencing that side against the fence on my shooting board, I'll dial in one end of the shelf. Now I can mark my parallel faces. The long edge is done just using a panel gauge with a knife blade. And then the length, I'm going to use a pencil and a square. Since I'll just shoot this edge later, I don't think a knife line is really necessary here. Now I can saw these to size. Here is an interesting point of clarification. I hear the term panel saw thrown around a lot, referring to backless saws. In actuality, a panel saw is a specific kind of backless saw that is 18 to 24 inches long and has a finer pitched tooth line like you're seeing here. It was typically designed, ironically, to saw panels to final size or very near to it. You see, these are perfect for the job for what I'm doing here when I need an accurate cut that is clean. The thinner nature of an already milled panel also does not require a coarser pitch saw, which likely will create more tearing on the back side of the cut. Later, these came to be known as toolbox saws because they were short enough to fit into a typical toolbox, and they come in crosscut too. Now these 26 inch and longer saws up on the wall here, they're not panel saws, and actually they're just called hand saws. Now I just need to repeat the jointing of the opposite edge and the shooting of the opposite end in order to get them all exactly to size. The finished size will be 5 eighths of an inch thick, 10 inches wide, 16 and 3 quarters of an inch long. And really what I do is focus on getting one shelf perfect. And then with the jointed edge and shot in, I can just line it up and trace around my panel to ensure that all of my shelves end up at exactly the same size. There's every possibility that your dados won't fit exactly the same from one to the other. It's just kind of a fact of life of cutting everything entirely by hand. They may be close, but they might just be slightly different. So as I come back and smooth plane these panels and really dial in that fit, it's important that you size each one individually to a specific dado. And I actually put a little mark down here on the end grain that will be covered up once it goes into the joint to tell me exactly what panel this is and exactly what dado it goes into. So these smoothing passes will not only dial in that perfect fit, but I'm finish prepping this panel now. So the only thing that needs to be done once I fit it here is apply the finish. So it's imperative that it doesn't get knocked around and you're careful with where you set it now so that you don't have to do this again and possibly affect the fit 
of that panel. When you first tackle one of these panels, you'll find that the smoothing plane, it doesn't create perfect shavings and it might take a couple of passes up and back before you get that full length, full width shaving. You have to remember here, I'm taking a shaving that's maybe a thousandth of an inch, probably even less than that. So the board has to be flat to within that tolerance along the length of the sole. And it sometimes can take a few passes to actually get it there. See, already I'm getting a more consistent shaving on this second pass across the board. But don't forget, I'm also dialing in a fit here. So don't get so caught up in your shavings that you suddenly end up with a loose board. Well, let's be honest. At a thousandth of an inch per pass, even if you go over a couple of passes, you're still going to be okay, especially once we apply glue and the water and the glue swells the whole joint up a little bit. Okay, it's a moment of truth. Let's put it all together. I want to assemble the entire piece so that I can lay out the location for the back slats. And again, having each one of these shelves marked for their orientation and of course their order is going to make things real helpful now that we've smooth planed everything. Okay, let's tip it up. Hey, what do you know? It's actually starting to look a little bit like the SketchUp model. That's always a good sign. Now I'll tilt it down on its front so I can begin working on the slats. With dividers, I can exactly position this into three equal segments. Now I want to mark the center line off those points from the dividers. And then matching a center line on the slat, I can trace the extents of this notch that I want to sink the slats into. I'll mark a depth of about a sixteenth of an inch. It really doesn't have to be that deep. And now I just need to kind of perforate this surface with a chisel. This is just like chopping a mortise. I'll work with the bevel towards me, working right up towards the edge, just ever so slightly perforating that surface so that it will come away cleanly when I pair it later. flip the bevel around and go back the other way, heading towards the opposite wall. When I get close to the opposite wall, I'll flip it around so that the flat is on the edge and keeping my pencil line, I'll chop down a vertical wall. If you remember, I trace the extents of the slats with the pencil. So the pencil line falls on the outside of the slat. So if I remove the pencil line, I'll have a notch that's too wide. So definitely leave those pencil lines. Then with just a little bit of pairing, you can see how easily those fibers will come away. That's what all that chopping and perforating does for you. And then it's just a matter of kind of cleaning that up, making sure it's level with a router plane. I don't have to use a router plane. I can continue pairing with a chisel, but the router plane makes it really easy and kind of idiot proof to get it all into the same plane. And there's the fit I'm looking for. You can see it's not so much about holding it in place, it's just registering it and it will make it easier to apply the nails. Now making sure the entire slot is square along the length of the shelf, I can come in and mark the extents of the rest of the notches all the way down the body. Now it's just a matter of repeating that a bunch more times so you've got notches for both slats on all four shelves.
All right, as I mentioned, I'm gonna secure these to the back with some decorative wrought head nails. Now, if you've never worked with cut nails, they're a little bit different. They are essentially a wedge and they hold really, really well, but you have to be careful how you position them in the wood. I want to position the wedge so it's working against the long grain of the slat, especially because the slat is relatively thin. If I drive it in 90 degrees so that the wedge is across the slat, it will split this slat. So it's imperative that you position it just right before you drive it in. Also, it's imperative that you drill pilot holes for these. Maybe some of the smaller cut nails you can get away without driving the pilot holes, but for these bigger rod head nails, it's really important. And the size of the pilot hole really depends upon the nail. And from manufacturer to manufacturer, they're gonna be a little bit different. You just have to make some test holes and uh, come up with a bit that's gonna work for you. Um, this is one that I actually keep in the handle of my egg beater. And uh, to tell you the truth, I don't remember the diameter of it anymore because I've been using it for a while. Um, I wanna say it's probably just under an eighth of an inch. I'm gonna pre-drill all these holes, but I don't wanna drive the nails just yet. I'll do that when I move on to glue up. I don't wanna, I wanna make sure that I can get this apart to be able to get glue in here before I start fastening and everything permanently. Last thing I wanna do before gluing up is to smooth plane every surface because it's gonna be real hard to get to these once it's glued up. I specifically have the overhead lights off and I'm working with nice raking light coming in from the side here. That raking light really allows me to see the surface, to see any milling marks, scratches, anything that could kind of stand out on the surface. It casts it in very high relief. It makes it real easy to see and therefore to clean up. And you'll notice that I'm just letting the weight of the plane do its job. I have my fingertips, I call this a fingertip grip, right out front. It's not really pushing down, it's just kind of guiding the plane. And moving it along. I find that if you grip it like this, you tend to manhandle the plane too much and a lot of times it won't do its job like it should. Down here on the taper, if I push down here, it's gonna lift it up and away from my dog. So I'll hold the board down here and just with one hand, you can see I'm pushing along here. So obviously I don't require really any downward pressure on the board in order for the smoothing plane to work. The last thing before glue up is to break all those sharp edges that again will be near impossible to get to once the shelf is assembled. And then I'm gonna chamfer the bottom of the leg. This little chamfer will prevent anything from chipping out as this is slid across the surface later on in its life. Now onto the glue up. A Little bit of glue in each one of the notches and a little bit of glue on the shelves themselves and I'll assemble it together. I'm being very conservative with the glue. I don't wanna to have to clean a bunch up because it's gonna be difficult to get into those nooks and crannies. And with a really strong dry fit already, I don't need to worry about a lot of glue to cover up possibly poorly cut joinery. I'll also glue the slats in place, but I won't install the nails just yet. I'll do that a little bit later. And that completes the construction part of this build. Now you may have noticed while I was gluing this up that I left all of the shelves just the tiniest bit proud of the legs themselves. Whatever that amount is, I didn't really measure it, it's just a little bit. I'm gonna come back once everything's dried and out of the clamps and I'm gonna flush those up with the surface with a smoothing plane. You may remember I smoothed up the tops and the bottoms and the ingrain into the shelves, but I didn't touch 
the edges because I knew that I would just be planing them flush later. That also will help clue up any, clean up any glue squeeze out right there at the joints. I wasn't too concerned about that. I'm gonna call it for this particular part now. And the next part, I will finish cleaning all that up and I will apply the finish. Now the reality is it's about three degrees outside right now. I'm filming this in late January. I will not be able to finish this until things warm up around here. If I try to finish with the garage door closed and the windows closed, I don't get any ventilation at all. And it's really quite dangerous. I've got a heater running right now, which keeps the temperature bearable in here. But truly for a finish to perform well, it needs to be above 60 degrees. And for me to get the proper ventilation, which I think is more important, I've got to open that garage door. So it's probably going to be several months before I'm going to actually be able to get this finished. However, I'll probably wait to publish this entire series until spring anyway, so you shouldn't have to wait that long. So that'll do it for me this time. Thanks for watching, folks. Next time, I will apply the finish.